That case was strange for a lot of reasons. Uh, it was f filed by Lynn Wood in Atlanta. I don't know if people know Lynn Wood. He's an extremely successful lawyer, uh, represented um, uh, Richard, Richard Jewell. Jewell in the Olympic bombing case against the Atlanta Constitution. He represented the parents of John Bede Ramsey in their dispute over whether they had been, in fact, involved in the death of their child. Um, uh, just a laundry list of big name plaintiff defamation cases. And we, we got into that case. Uh, Judge Steve Wilson, many people know of him, had just denied uh, Musk's motion to dismiss the case. Didn't bring the motion as an anti-slap motion because they were concerned uh, with the, their exposure to attorney's fees, which when we, we, my reaction was, well, if you didn't have that much confidence in the motion, why would you bring this anyway? You're just a line. I, anyway, I, I just, I thought it was not a great strategic idea, but it wasn't ours to make at the time. But sometimes if you make a motion to dismiss, all you do is get the judge to think about the case in a way that's very favorable to your opponent that becomes very difficult to undo later on in the case. And that turned out to be what happened here in a number of ways. Anyway, we had Judge Wilson runs a rocket docket. He gave us five months, actually gave us four, three months to get ready for trial. But because of some uh, issues with the lawyers, he gave us an extra month and a half. So we go to trial on December 7th. And going into that trial, we thought we were in a boatload of trouble. Um, Elon Musk, we, people may know, uh, was uh, not directly involved in rescuing these kids from uh, the cave in Thailand in the summer of 2018. Vern Unsworth was on scene, lived through it, helped advise with the rescue. He didn't participate in the rescue because he's not a cave diver, but he had intimate knowledge of that cave that was instrumental. Elon Musk decided uh, that he and his people should respond to pleas for help, and so he got 50 of his engineers at SpaceX to see what they could come up with in the boring company. They thought of drilling. They thought of all kinds of ideas. They didn't have a lot of time. And so they said, why don't we take some of our SpaceX parts and try and make a rescue pod or a rescue sub that can extract some of these kids because these are extremely dangerous conditions. It's not an easy just pull them out of the cave. It's a mile through torturous, uh, turbulent water that's like coffee because it's mud filled. So. They build this rescue pod, they fly it over there, and by the time they get there, fortunately, they were able to have extracted the kids with a uh, complicated dive process and sedation of the kids so they wouldn't panic. Uh, and so Musk goes on to Shanghai to, to work on his, his Tesla factory there. A couple days later, Vern Unsworth, who was involved in the rescue, the two had never met, goes on CNN and is asked a question. What did you think of Mr. Musk's uh, rescue sub? And he grimaces and says he can stick it where it hurts. It would have had no chance of success, wouldn't have made it the first 50 feet past the dive point, totally just a PR stunt, etc. cetera. Um, Musk is stunned. He thinks like, wow, we tried to help. And who is this guy? I never met him. So he sends a series of tweets and he says, I don't know who this guy is. Never met him. He lives in a part of Thailand, Paran Sus. Um, the thing would have worked. We'll make a video, blah, blah, blah. Sorry, pedo guy. You really did ask for it. Pedo guy. That's early <laughs> July. Um, Mr. Unsworth goes on TV, says this is outrageous. I'm going to take legal action. And then at the end of July, Musk tweets uh, to somebody, don't you think it's uh, interesting that he hasn't sued me? Uh, <laughs> and then a few days later, Lynn Wood sends Musk's team and, and Musk a letter explaining that uh, they are about to get sued. Um, Nothing happens for a while. Musk gets entangled with a reporter for BuzzFeed and ends up sending the reporter an email that he writes off the record on. But in the course of the email, he says, why don't you basically get off your ass, um, use more pointed language than that, you a-hole, go there and investigate what's going on. Stop defending child rapists. Uh, the, that then gets printed in a BuzzFeed article, and Unsworth says, uh, I'm suing, and he sues. Um, 
And so we're thinking, okay, our client said some really bad things about this guy. Um, he seems like a pretty nice guy. Uh, he's got a very experienced lawyer. Linwood shows up to depose Elon Musk and is asking, he's, the way he's asking the questions, the way he's getting to the point, you can tell this is somebody who knows what they're doing in defamation. This is somebody who's been through a lot of trials and knows how to get things for trial. And uh, we moved for summary judgment, <laughs> didn't win, had very uphill climb. We also lost the issue of whether the plaintiff was a limited purpose public figure or a private figure. And it came down to the third prong of that test on germaneness. And I had what was a clever but not persuasive argument as to why calling Unsworth uh, a pedo guy uh, was germane to the public controversy over who should be believed about what was in the best interest of these children. The judge didn't buy it. That's his right. So we go to trial. Um, and I think the, the way that case came out, the way it came out was because of how that case was tried. And one thing made a big difference before the trial was they never, the jury never heard any damage experts. So in closing <laughs> argument, when Unsworth's lawyer was asking for a tremendous amount of money, he was really just making it up, pulling it out of What was their number? He wanted $5 million in actual damages. And I remember thinking, like, yeah, that's a lot of money. It's okay. <clears throat> then he wanted $35 million in presumed damages, which is for libel per se, he was entitled to request. And then he said, look, this is Elon Musk. He stipulated that he's worth over $20 billion. You've got to do something significant if you're going to punish him, punish him with $150 million in punitives. And you can see the jurors thinking like, wow, that's, those are big numbers. Where are you getting it from? Well, they actually did have somebody who was going to testify to a lot of that money um, in the form of reputation repair around the world. And he had a lot of interesting charts and analyses, and he's he is a PR consultant. I took his deposition and I got what I thought were some very good concessions. He was also going to testify that it was reasonably foreseeable to Musk when he wrote that off the record email to BuzzFeed that it would be republished. And so we moved in limine to exclude this expert. Um, and because I thought I got a lot of concessions out of him, then some things he said were actually pretty good for us. Instead of opposing the motion, the day before their opposition was due, they said, oh, by the way, we're withdrawing him. Hmm. Um, and then they did. They made another maneuver right before trial that was kind of interesting. They decided, they said, we're not going to be relying on this BuzzFeed uh, article. Uh, we're going to base our claim solely on the original tweet accusing the plaintiff of being wow. a pedo guy. Why? But... I'll tell you, I tell you what, but like child rapist was but we're keeping strong. we're keeping that in to show malice, and that that's and so we had a big fight it, right before the trial started as to whether that they could do that and whether it was a, you know these later statements were relevant to show malice at the time you know months earlier and judge said no it's coming in. Um, I don't know that they made a great use of it to the jury. I don't think the jury understand what they were understood what they were doing with it, but there were a lot of moving pieces right before the case started. The, the next. Then, then it was just a peculiar experience at trial, and it was not what we expected. Elon Musk, they called adverse as their first witness. Now, that's a little bit unusual. Typically, you'd call the plaintiff, and you'd want to immediately get the plaintiff's story out, get some rapport with the jury, some emotional notes, whatever. That's not what they wanted to do. They wanted to go after Musk. So for a day or so, there was Musk. Then we did redirect and then they did their recross. Um, Musk, to his credit, did a great job. He came across as a human being, contrite. He apologized to the plaintiff. He said, look, you know, uh, I'm sorry for what I said. It, you know, my mom would not be proud of me for having said this, um, and I wish I hadn't said it. Uh, you know, it was a playground spat. And that was the other thing. Our theme was that this is just two guys going at it in the media. The plaintiff picked the fight, called Musk, um, said, you know, stick it where it hurts, and said, basically, the whole thing you did here to try and save these kids wouldn't have worked. It actually put their lives at risk. It was done for your own personal PR advantage. And that was a pretty horrible thing to say. And Musk just retaliated. It was inappropriate. It escalated. But he immediately apologized. He took the tweets down within an hour. Um, and so 
you know, try and contain the fire a little bit as just that kind when of a fight. When did the apology happen? At the trial or was it no, an apology before he apologized. Well, three times. He apologized. They said it was not an effective or sufficient apology. The first tweets were July 14th or 15th, somewhere in there. The and he took them down within a few hours, and then he apologized about 48 hours later, 36 hours later. Mm -hmm. He apologized at his deposition, and then he apologized in front of the jury at trial. The plaintiff was strident, and I, you know, character is fate, as Shakespeare says, and I think maybe this is an example of it, because I think the, the way we crossed him, and Bill Price did a phenomenal job of this, he came across as a guy um, who he would not apologize to Musk, didn't think he owed Musk an apology, thought his life was ruined, this was, you know, a terrible, terrible thing had happened to him. After I deposed him, he produced about this thick of a set of pages of texts running with a guy, a friend of his in Thailand over almost a year period that I would have loved to have had when I deposed him, where he just looked like a horrible human being. And he was out for publicity, was, was going to cut the divers off for, make them pay for cutting him out of the loop. Oh my God. He said derogatory racial things Is about, this Unsworth? The, Unsworth, about wow. the cave, the Thai cave dive team, this Navy SEALs, one of whom died in the rescue, said terrible things. That used Did any of that get into the trial? Oh, you bet. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> well, yeah. And so we know. showed this stuff in the cross. And so I think by the end of that cross, it was like, huh. The other thing is, there was another witness, um, Musk's, the head of his home office or family office, Jared Birchall, who was not, an, not a lawyer, he's a, he's a financial person, had done something that we thought the jury was going to hate. And that is that... Um, after Musk was threatened with this lawsuit, they went and, and accepted an offer by somebody to, to do PI work. This person said, I can get you the goods that this guy really is a pedophile or engaged in bad things. It turns out this guy was nothing but that. He was a fraud, convicted felon for financial fraud, and now is back in jail. But in, it was in reliance on his dossier on the plaintiff that caused Musk to accuse him of being a child rapist. And that's why I think maybe they, they pulled that. And anyway, they hired this guy to dig up this dirt. He infiltrated Musk's UK legal team. And, and it, it, there, there could have been just the most horrific evidence, uh, and we lost our motion in limine on it, um, that this investigation and all this conduct, and I don't, I don't think the plaintiff really made a good use of that at trial. And I think um, it was just really preparing our witnesses, keeping their damage expert out, and the way their people came across was their undoing. And then at the end, in the, in the closing argument, to ask for all of that money for what we had said was just you know careless playground taunting seemed very much undeserved. And so the jury deliberated for 40 minutes, uh, including their lunch, and came back very quickly.